Good evening. Let's stand for our call to worship. It'll be hymn number 304. We'll sing the first and last of Crown Him with Many Crowns. Crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne. Hark now in heavenly anthems down, all music but his own. Awake my soul and sing, who died for thee. King through all eternity. Crown him, Lord of love. Behold his hands and side. Those wounds yet visible above in beauty glorified. All hail, For thou hast died for me, thy praise and glory shall not fail throughout eternity. It's good to see you here tonight, and we appreciate you coming. I'm going to ask if you would to remember these that we've mentioned earlier today. Uh, that have special needs for prayer. We had Junior Peavy, uh, Mary Price, Mr. Jimmy McCain. We'll be having surgery this week at Forest General on Thursday. Also, Glenda Dobson, uh, Paisley Riles, also Bobby Patterson, a uh, knee replacement, I understand. Peyton Nace will have surgery on Friday this week at Southern Bona Joint. And also, Tom Todd family. Do you have an unspoken request? Would you raise your hand, please? Okay, a lot of you do. Let's bow forward to prayer, and then we'll continue on. Let us pray. Father, we lift our friends, Lord, our neighbors up to you in prayer tonight. Uh, Lord, the ones who have special needs. If we just, Lord, sometimes it's difficult when we pray and pray, and Lord, we see no healing come. But God, we know that it may not be your will to heal some people here on this earth. But we know ultimately, if they're your child, they will be healed, Lord, as they go to be with you. Lord, we just pray for those family members that stand with those individuals through the difficult times. Uh, Lord, we just pray, God, that you would strengthen the faith of those. And Lord, we know many of our different friends have terminal cancer. And, uh, Lord, we know that it's uh, difficult to watch them uh, struggle and their family struggle through this hard time. Uh, Lord, we, tonight we just pray for Paul Stringer. Lord, we just pray, God, also for Bruce McGee. And, Father, we just pray that, Lord, that you would truly extend your mercy to them. Uh, Lord, we know that your grace is sufficient to carry them through this time. Uh, Lord, we pray that as they go through this time, that they would sense your presence like they've never sensed it before. Lord, help us as, as friends and family to encourage these and others that we know of. We hear so much sadness and, and things that are happening to people. Lord, we, and families, and Lord, just pray, God, for, for strength. And, Lord, we just pray you'd help us to help them the best we can. Tonight we lift our church up in prayer, praying that you would be with us as we move forward, Lord, toward the road to Calvary. We pray, God, that you would use each one of us to, to reach out to people in this opportunity you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for each one that's come tonight. I pray that you would continue to be with us help us to receive all we need to receive tonight uh, from this uh, time of music and as well as preaching tonight for we know that we're totally dependent upon you lord to hear a word from you in jesus name we pray amen you may be seated uh, i wanted to give you uh, many of you received a call we was able to get it put out some of you are not able to receive it we've um the vote today was 92 4 and 40 against uh, and that is the results of the vote today. At this time, Brock's going to come. I'd, I'd love to see you wings tonight, by the way, for our Bible study time.
Good evening and welcome back with us tonight. Uh, a few announcements, uh, some that I didn't cover this morning and some that it will be a repeat. Uh, the Prayer Warriors uh, for the Road to Calvary, if you've signed up for that, uh, or you can sign up for that, we're going to uh, need you to come to the sanctuary and pray between 5 and 6 on each night of the drama, the 18th, the 19th, and the 20th. If you're interested in still signing up for that, there's a table behind the last pew in the sanctuary. If you have any questions, you can direct those to Miss Brenda Parker. Uh, also, that prayer group will meet 6 o'clock this week in the chapel on Wednesday. Uh, and then, uh, just a reminder, the Brotherhood Breakfast uh, will be this coming Sunday morning at 7 a.m. with Mr. Mac Davis as the speaker. Also, uh, Road to Calvary Wise, I still need help with parking. So if you don't have a, or if you're not participating in the play or the drama and uh, and would like to help us out in some way, you can help in parking. Um, I didn't get the cybership training numbers from Mr. Mike. I'll do it old school. Hand them out. There's some flyers right out here. I've been told by the piano on the. Um, tables out here if you're interested in picking some of those up distributing those at work or uh, you know places you go uh, they're out here and available for you if you want to take those with you. you may remain seated we will sing um, three hymns 156 460 and 511 Jesus, what a friend for sinners, Jesus, lover of my soul. Friends may fail me, foes assail me, he, my Savior, makes me
carry on, raised in his power, become strong, his strength is perfect, his strength is perfect, let's sing that again. His strength is perfect when our strength is gone. He'll carry us when we can carry on. Raised in His power, the weak. Become strong. His strength is perfect. His strength is perfect. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ's solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to hide my face, I rest on his unchanging grace. On every high and stormy gap, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath is in His blood support me in the flood. When all around my soul gives way, He is the all I hope and stay. On Christ's solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Let's stand for our offertory hymn. It'll be hymn number 545. We'll sing the first and third. Living for Jesus. Living for Jesus. A life that is true, striving to please Him in all that I do, yielding allegiance, glad hearted and free. This is the pathway of blessing for me oh jesus lord and savior i give myself to thee for thou in thine atonement didst give thyself for me i own no other master my heart shall be my throne, my life I give henceforth to live, O Christ, for Thee alone. Living for Jesus through earth's little while, my dearest treasure, the light of his smile, seeking the lost one, he died to redeem, 
bringing the weary to find rest in Him. Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to Thee. For Thou and Thine atonement didst give myself for me. I own no other master. My heart shall be Thy throne. My life I give henceforth to live. O Christ, for Thee alone. Dear Lord, thank you for dear Lord, thank you for this day, and thank you for letting us get to come here and worship you, and help Brother Tim as he brings the message. Bless this offering in your name, I pray. Amen. Excuse me. Well, if you have your Bibles, we want to go to the Old Testament tonight in chapter 40 in the book of Genesis. And uh, we'll read 15 verses there tonight. I guess it was right after we put the stage up. I wasn't used to it being in here. And I come bebopping through here. That's a word that my kids laugh at me about saying bebop. That's an old word, isn't it? And a 70s word. But I come walking through here, and with the lights, I had just flipped these little two lights on. I forgot all about that corner of that, and I landed on top of that second pew right there. I heard my back just, like you do your fingers, just crunch. And I have been having back trouble ever since then, and it's been a while now. So if uh, some Mr. Howard was asking me this morning, says, your neck? No, I said, it's my back. So anyway, um, so it's been sort of out, going in and out. I've seen the doctor twice with it. But anyway, it's... A lot of pain, so if I grimace, it's because I'm hurting in my back. So if you will, just pardon, pardon me and, and work with me on it. So anyway, um, but we want to, uh, I guess my mom and dad, my mother mainly, told me this story, and there's a little st- song, and I'm not going to sing the song, but it goes with Genesis 40 about uh, Joseph and his coat of many colors. And uh, we're, it, it's a very special little song, and many of you remember the coat of many colors, and and uh, we're going to be talking about Joseph tonight and his prison experience. Uh, a, a butler, a baker, and a believer. And we, we're we going to just jump right in. It's the whole kind of, uh, there's a lot of things to say about Joseph's life, but this is sort of just sort of right in the middle of his life in chapter 40. We'll jump right in. And there's a lot that I want to say tonight about a butler and a baker and, and a believer and the main just one sermon in a sentence would be never forget, never forget. And um, so let's just read there 15 verses. We'll probably go through the whole chapter in preaching, but it's not that many verses. But we'll read here as Joseph interprets a dream. It says, Then it came about after these things, the cupbearer and the baker for the king of Egypt offended their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was furious with his two officials. 
the chief, chief cupbearer and the chief baker. And so he put them in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard in the jail in the same place where Joseph was imprisoned. And the captain of the bodyguard put Joseph in charge of them and he took care of them and they were in confinement for some time. Verse 5, Then the cupbearer and the baker for the king of Egypt who were confined in jail both had a dream the same night. And each man with his own dream and each dream with his own interpretation. And when Joseph came to them in the morning and observed them, behold, they were dejected. And he asked Pharaoh's officials who were with him in confinement in his master's house, Why are your faces so sad today? And then they said to him, We have had a dream, and there is no one to interpret it. And then Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell it to me, please. And so the chief cupbearer told the dream to Joseph. And he said to him, In my dream, behold, there was a vine in front of me. And on the vine were three branches. And as it was budding, its blossoms came out, and its clusters produced ripe grapes. Now Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. So I took the grapes and squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup. And I put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. And then Joseph said to him, This is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Within three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office. And you will put Pharaoh's cup into his hand according to your former custom when you were his cupbearer. Only keep me in mind when it goes well with you. And please do me a kindness by mentioning me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. For I was in fact kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews. And even here I have done nothing that they should have put me in this dungeon. Let us pray. Father, help us to, as we do this Bible study tonight, Lord, help us to share the truth of the Bible. Lord, help us to do our very best. In Jesus' name, amen. The importance of this chapter cannot be overstated. And I always like to hear Bible stories as kids growing up. I remember, and I remember the story about Joseph. And Joseph was a very special person. God had definitely had his hand on him. And so I'd like for us to just take an opportunity to look at chapter 40 tonight. If you will bear with me, we'll, I want to basically teach tonight some things about this chapter. The last chapter of 39, a little bit before chapter here, uh, chapter 39 showed that Joseph was enslaved in the country of Egypt. And so this chapter now is showing us that this great man who loved God, he's down in a prison. And he's going through things that are absolutely shocking for a person that is a teenager. And so if they had television back in that day, I'm sure that they could have reported that a teenage boy was thrown into prison. Well, basically, excuse me, into a pit by his brothers. And later on, they drug him out of this pit and they sold him into slavery for 20 pieces of silver. And he later was accused by a wicked woman, Potiphar's wife, of sexual crime. But he was not guilty of it. And he was put into prison. And so this story probably would have high ratings if they had a t television back in that day. And, of course, we all know that they didn't. And so these experiences of Joseph, it shows how that God prepares a believer to be the person that they should be and that they could be when God has called them to do a work. And so I'd like to take a closer look at three things tonight. First of all, we see the detention. Joseph is in prison for something that he had not done. And now we find that the butler and the baker, they're also in prison for something that they are accused of doing. Verses 1 through 4 here. I want you to notice there, and Joseph is cast into prison, and it's terrible to be cast into prison for something that you actually had done, and you know that you've done wrong, and you have to, you've done the crime, and so you have to do the time. But here's this guy, he's down in prison for something and he didn't do. And that's an awful thing to be put into prison for something that you did not do. I know that I love to watch Forensic Files, and many of you have had the opportunity to watch that show. And one thing that I really noticed, and, and that's, I've always had an interest in it, cops run in my family. Uh, and I had planned to be a cop at one time before God called me in the ministry. And all through high school, I wanted to be a highway patrol. 
And, uh, but God didn't see fit for me to do that. And so these forensic files that we watch and all of these other CSIs, and one thing is in common. They have that little thing called DNA. That through DNA, they've discovered in literally in life, in real life, that there's, there's many women, there's people that's put into prison that should have never been placed into prison. And that's a horrible thing. But not only that, they, they, through DNA, they've discovered that there's some people that actually have been put to death that they didn't do the crime. And so here we are, this teenage boy snatched up from a wealthy father, Jacob. He's thrown into the pit to die. There, it was thrown in by his brothers. He's later sold as a slave into Egypt. And so once he's in prison, the Bible tells us that Pharaoh's personal butler and his personal baker was cast into prison. So the guy that takes care, his butler, whatever he needs, that's the butler, what he does. And, of course, we all know the baker, what he does, he bakes food. And so these two fellows are, are placed into prison. The chief butler was the cupbearer to the king. And so the person was in charge of the king's vineyards and the wines. And, and so it was likely that his duty was not only to oversee the king's wine operation, but to personally serve the king. Even he would go to the point of tasting the food to make sure that no one had actually poisoned the food. And so the chief baker, of course, we all know that he was in charge of the food. And so he was responsible to make sure the king was not poisoned through what he actually ate. And so notice both of these men were chief officials in their own areas within Pharaoh's palace. And while they were the cupbearer and the baker, they were placed in prison. Notice in verse number 2, it says, And Pharaoh was wroth. He was very angry. He was mad. And they were put into prison because he were, we don't know what, exactly what was going on there, why they were in prison. Scripture does not tell us that. Not even a hint's given. And all that it said is that Pharaoh was wroth. That means he was angry. He was upset. Most likely had, they had something to do with these two men's position, the cupbearer and the baker. Henry Morris, he has suggested as a possibility of why that these fellows were placed into prison. And if we use common sense about this thing, I think that we would say so too. You think about a person that's cooking food. You think about a person that's making the wine or the, does the, the, you know, the cup bear. More likely, they, one of them got caught for trying to poison the king or were, was not up on his job doing it. And somebody else done it, and he's, he's responsible for it. But anyway... The two most likely things that could have happened, uh, one of the most likely things that happened was probably was poisoning. And so we don't know exactly, uh, but we do know that the chief baker was later executed. And so there was a capital crime that probably had been committed. And as stated, just what their crime was is unknown, but they're, according to their profession and the execution of the baker, it suggests that the baker here or, or some servant under him was planning to poison the Pharaoh. Whatever the case, the significant fact is this. They was put in the same political prison as Joseph. And here they are. They're down in the slammer together in, in verse number 3. And so Joseph was placed in charge of the cupbearer and the baker. He was assigned the duty of serving and caring for the king's needs. Let's move on rather quickly through this. If you'll notice here in verse number 5, something unusual happened. Once they was placed down there in the prison with Joseph, in verse 5 we read, there it says, and they dreamed a dream, and they just was disturbed about this. I don't know if you've ever had a dream that you were disturbed. You woke up, and it seemed so realistic to you. Uh, I know that one night I had a dream, and, and, and I just dreamed that this big, I don't know, this has nothing to do with the message, but I, talking about dreams. I had dreamed this big hairy arm came through the window. It was the biggest arm I've ever seen in my life. And it just came in and just grabbed me in the bed, and I woke up, and Brendan said, you're having a nightmare, you're, and I was screaming. And so it, 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 there's dreams that can actually disturb you. And that was one that I'm not quite sure whose hairy arm that was. And uh, could have been Corey's. I don't know. And, uh, but anyway, just joking with you, Corey. And so, but the fact of the matter is when you have a dream, and, you know, it, it can disturb you. And, and so it was with these two fellows here in, in, in prison. Whatever the, the earthly cause was, God was apparently behind the dreams. We know this because it would have been their, uh, their, their it, it really disturbed them. And so the very fact that both of these men had a dream on the same night, a dream that was to actually come true. And it points to God quickening the dreams with, within their mind. And so this, of course, doesn't mean that, that all dreams are future events. So God used Joseph's prison experience to teach him to care for others and to be kind to them. In this situation, how long had Joseph been suffering in prison? We don't know. Some believe 10, some believe 15 years. But anyway, this would, uh, would put him somewhere around 30 years of age right now. 
And so all scripture says that it was sometime later that these dreams occurred. How do we know that it was some years later? Well, we know this generally for three reasons. Number one, he certainly would have not been put in the position of over the prisoners if he were just 17 years of age. And so we know that some years had transpired before he was promoted to this position. Not only that, number two, the reason that we know that it was many years later when the baker and the cupbearer had these dreams in prison is because uh, it was Potiphar who had put him there and because of the lie that his wife had told. Now, we don't know if Potiphar had died or if there was a, you know, he had been defrocked from his position or whatever, but if he was still living or not. But nevertheless, Joseph would not have been put over these prisoners if Potiphar had still been around, more than likely. Also, thirdly, it would have also had taken a long time for the warden to notice Joseph's hard work that he was doing in order for him to be promoted up the ladder. And so for these three reasons, Joseph was put in the position of being over the other prisoners years later. And again, why would God allow these things to happen to Joseph? Well, Joseph needed to learn to care for people and to be kind to people as he was there in that prison experience. And so have you ever had anything to do with making stones smooth? You know, I love to look at stones a lot of times. That I don't know, it's just as a kid, I'd go out and grab a parking lot that we had in front of my house, and I would look at those stones, and I'd love to see fossils and stuff inside of these little small stones. But if you know anything about stones, you could take stones and you could put those stones inside of a tumbler. And for hours and hours, those stones turn, and they, uh, for hours on end, the rough rocks begin to get smooth over a period of time after hours and hours of this tumbling. The rough edges get knocked off and things like that. Well, Joseph, at one time in his life, was very, apparently, an arrogant, bragging teenager. But now God's allowing him to go through the school of hard knocks to be able to get all of the rough edges knocked off of him. Now, you and I both know that you and I both go through life, and we have to go through the school of hard knocks sometimes ourselves because we're probably not the same person today that we were in 17 years of age because we've changed, and, and sometimes God begins to shape us. And so it was with Joseph. I want you to notice now verse 5 through 19. We look at the dreams. Let's look at that for just a moment. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the Old Testament, God used dreams and he used visions to be able to communicate with people. And why? Because they, di they didn't have a, a Bible as we have to be able to instruct them, to be able to have a, 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 a guide for our life. And so believers are not therefore to be seeking dreams from God, uh, nor to seek to find guidance or strength from them. But God has given us his word and the Holy Spirit to be able to guide us. And so these are our guides, not our dreams. But in fact, believers... We don't need to de depend on anybody else for the strength that we need except the Lord. Yeah, we have friends to give us encouragement, but we need the Holy Spirit of God to give us the direction that we need. So if you, if you did have a dream or a vision that can't be backed up by Scripture, you can rest assured that that dream or that vision did not come from the Lord. Look at verse number 6, and it says, And Joseph came in unto them in the morning, and he looked upon them, and behold, they were sad. You can tell when a person is upset. You can tell when a person is excited. You can look at their demeanor. You can look at their actions, the way they're act acting. Have you ever looked at someone's facial expression and you knew that something is not right with this person? Uh, and so the next morning when Joseph came into the prison cells, he noticed the sadness on their face. These two other fellows here. It caught his attention. And so Joseph showed a concern from him. He asked, he said, why are you, basically your countenance is so down. Why are you so sad? And then verse number seven, if you're following along, he asked, he asked Pharaoh's officers that were with him in the, in the ward of his Lord's house, saying, wherefore look ye so sadly today. The Bible tells us that when Joseph saw them, he could tell by their unhappy uh, faces that they were unhappy campers. And so Joseph's concern, and Joseph had a kindness in his heart. He was in charge of taking care of them. And so he was concerned about them. Again, I remind you that Joseph was in prison for a crime that he had never committed. And he could have said, well, you know what? <laughs> I don't have time to deal with these folks. You know, that's their problem. And I have my own problems. They can take care of their own. I'm going to take care of my own. I'm not going to fool with them. You know? And so we could do the same thing sometimes in life. He could have said that, but that's not what the Bible teaches. We read in Galatians 6, 2. There's about four verses that I want to give you very quickly. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2, it says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens. Get under the load with another person. Give them the encouragement they need. Acts 20 and verse number 35, it says, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak, 
and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Another passage of Scripture, Romans 15, 1, says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. In Ephesians 4, 32, And be you kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. He could have ignored these two Egyptian officials, but he didn't. Because they were, they were people that were enslaved and they were in prison. He could have had bitter hatred in his heart for him, but he didn't. And Joseph was compelled to care for him. And he was learning what God wanted him to learn. One of the saddest things that I think that you can do in life is to go through a faith lesson and not catch or get or remember or do what God wants us to do during that time. God allows us to go through situations. We need to learn from that situation. Wouldn't it be sad to go through that situation and we never really, the light comes on for us to receive the lesson that he wants us to learn from that situation? Every Christian should have a life verse that sticks with them every single day of their life. If you don't have one, I want to suggest one for you tonight. In Ephesians 4, 32, I just said it just a few moments ago. And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. No matter how bad our circumstances are, God wants to learn from the circumstances. To be kind, to be tenderhearted, to be forgiving for one another. He wants us to learn to care for others and to be kind for them, to them. And we are to be concerned for others. And so the chief cupbearer and the baker, they just couldn't figure out what these dreams was all about. And this is what they told Joseph. And they had dreamed during the night. They didn't have someone to interpret the, the dreams there. And this is where Joseph acknowledged the power of God. If you'll notice in verse number 8 there, if you're following along in chapter 40 and verse 8, notice what Joseph done. He acknowledged God. He said, tell me. Notice what he said. He said, and they said unto him, we have a dream and there is no interpreter. And Joseph said unto them, do not interpretations belong unto God? He acknowledged that God is the one. He declared that God knew exactly what these dreams meant. And so the suggestion was that, that God knew everything and God could give the meaning of the dreams. And Joseph had a witness for the Lord. He didn't claim to have the power. He emphatically declared that the Lord himself is the interpreter. His trust was in God. Joseph listened to the dreams of these two fellows as they began to share their heart in verses 9 through 11. And I want you to notice what the dream revealed. He saw a vine in front of him. In verse 9, the vine had three branches, and the branches budded, blossomed, and bore grapes. And so notice also, he immediately held the cup of the Pharaoh in his hand. He took the grapes, pressed them in the cup, and handed it to the Pharaoh. In verse 11, Joseph interpreted the dream for him. In verse 12 and 13, I want you to notice the interpretation of the baker now. And I'm sure that after he had heard it, he probably wished that he had never heard it because it was not as good for this fellow. In verse 16 through 19, I think that we all agree that this was a bad dream. And I don't like having bad dreams. just like the big hairy arm and so many others. But the very thing that Joseph told him, it did happen to him. Pharaoh put him on another end of a rope and he hung him. And he died because he was trying to poison him. I want you to notice lastly the destination. In verse 20 through 23, and it came to pass the third day, we didn't read this a while ago, and it came to pass the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast unto all of his servants. And he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among the servants. And he restored the chief butler unto his butlership again. And he gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. And yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. If it had not been for Joseph, the, the cupbearer would not have been restored to his position. You know, sometimes we have a tendency to forget sometimes what God has done in our life. I don't remember the date when this took place. But Japan had a terrible earthquake. The United States wanted to help them out. And because we did, one of the officials in Japan said, we will never forget what you've done. We will never forget America for the, America for the kindness you have shown. It was not long, we all know the story of history. It was not too far out from that that Japan dropped bombs on Pearl Harbor. 
they forgot. We must not ever forget. Just Joseph had been forgotten in that prison. The one that he interpreted the dream for, Joseph basically said, please don't forget me. But he, were, he was forgotten. We don't need to forget what our parents have done for us. We do not need to forget the good that our family has shown us. And we don't need to forget the kindness that our friends have shown to us. The cupbearer is restored to his position as cupbearer. But he forgot about his good friend, Joseph, who God used to make this happen. As we stop and ponder tonight, have we forgotten? I pastored a, a gentleman one time, and his name is, many of you may have heard of him. His name is Marty Stewart, and uh, he is on uh, the Farm Channel on television a lot. I know him personally. I was his pastor for five years. And one thing that go coincides with this message of what he told me, Marty Stewart looked at me in my house. He was sitting in the parsonage at Old Pearl Valley Baptist Church in Philadelphia. And Marty said, never forget your roots. Never forget where you come from. He would always come off the road, and he would go back home. He said, I do this to keep myself where I need to be. He said, I know I had the right reason. There's times that I veered off course, and I did not live for the Lord. He said, but you need to always come back home. You need to always remember, never forget. Never forget your hometown. Never forget your family. Never forget who you are. And never forget who you represent. And so it is. We do not need to be like this one that was in prison. Joseph said, please don't forget me. He went out, was restored, and he forgot all about Joseph and the prison. But just because Joseph was in prison did not mean that God had forgotten him. God was right there with him through that ex prison experience. So it is. God has not forgotten you if you are in a prison experience in your lifetime as well. There's a lot that we can learn through Scripture, and many time, times people tell me, well, you know, it's hard for me to understand or uh, apply the Old Testament to my life. There's a lesson on every page for us, and so it is in the life of Joseph. In the prison experience that he went through, we learn some people will forget you, but we need to learn never forget God, never forget your family, never forget your church, never forget where you come from, and never forget who you represent. So tonight I ask you the simple question, have you forgotten? Have you forgotten who you are and whose you are? God has not forgotten you, and he still loves you. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for never forgetting us. Now, Lord, there's times we get so busy and we, get, we've, we, we fall away from you. Lord, just thank you that you bring us close back to where we need to be. Lord, you, you allow things to happen in our life, and it's painful. And we have to go maybe through a, a prison experience. It may not be a literal prison, but it, it's an experience that God allows us to knock the rough edges off like the rock machine that tumbles those rocks to make them smooth, to iron out the wrinkles in our life and to make the rough edges a little bit smoother. Father, we know that as we go through those times, it's, it's, it's difficult, and it hurts, and it's pain. But, Lord, we know just through that whole experience that Joseph had, God had not forgotten him. And, Lord, I know that you, you don't forget us either as we go through these experiences. Father, help us tonight, if we've forgotten, to remember. Remember that you still love us. And remember that you're still looking out for our good. Help us to learn from every situation, the prison experiences and the lonely deserts. Help us to remember that you still are where you've always been. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand? Hymn number 332. Son. 
sunshine feel its inmost part with not a cloud Thank you so much for being here tonight. I appreciate your faithfulness to come. Um, just wanted to remind you about a couple of things. A week from tonight, will we have our first uh, presentation of the Road to Calvary. We will not have discipleship training um, next week because of the Road to Calvary. And um, just for as cast members, if y'all will, to park around back, we need to free all the space up in front uh, for each one of those nights that we're going to actually have the production. So it'll be the Sunday night and then... Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night following that, so 18, 19, 20. If you need some, uh, some little flyers and things like that to pass out, we have some on this table right out here of both sizes, the standard sheet size and the bigger poster size. So if you'd like to have some of those, if we run out, we can get you some more. Um, let's see. Do you have anything? Think it's meet and be leave following service tonight? Yes, sir. That's that time change, isn't it? Mm, spring. Spring, spring forward. That means so um, spring ahead. Before you go to bed Saturday night, make sure you move that clock. And uh, forward is spring forward. So, But a brotherhood breakfast starts at, and the cooks arrive at 5.30, quarter to 6. So that will be um, the uh, brotherhood breakfast. Mac Davis is going to be our guest speaker. And uh, hopefully we'll have a good crowd with that. Uh, don't forget, uh, we'll have a prayer time at 6 o'clock. Had a really good crowd this past week. I was very encouraged. Uh, 6 o'clock, out at the chapel right here. Uh, this upcoming Wednesday night, I'm looking forward also to Bible study in here. Uh, we'll be going each week, whatever the Lord leads us, in different devotions, Bible studies, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I'm really looking forward to that. So we finished our spiritual gift study. And um, did anybody else have any announcements? Anything you need to remember? Anything at all? Just trying to remember something I'm supposed to tell you. But anyway, all right. Well, um, if uh, if it is, we'll tell you. Later.